Welcome back, folks. This is going to be one of those really important discussions. Today, we're going to explore three-phase systems. Know that this is just the first of several lectures where we will introduce the concept. We're going to focus in on something called a per-phase calculation, which is good news for you. What it says is that we can take a three-phase system, and rather than deal with all of the complexity, we can simplify it and handle it as if it was a single phase system, which means everything you already learned up to this point is still applicable. Before we do, let's take a review of complex power with a couple of worked examples, and then a transformer with a couple of worked examples. Power is additive. Mathematically, we would say the total complex power is equal to the summation of the individual powers. For example, suppose you had three loads. We'll let the first one be pure resistive at five kilowatts. The second load is 40 kW with a power factor of 80%. And the third load is pure capacitive, and that will give us 5 kVars. Again, that's 5 kVars capacitive. Before you do the calculation, I would encourage you to present the power triangle for each load. For example, the resistor is very easy. In fact, it's not even a power triangle to speak of because it's 5 kilowatts all real. The capacitor is very easy because it's negative 5 k bars. It's all imaginary. The middle load takes a bit more work. We start with a power triangle. By the way, I should have specified that this was inductive. Because it's inductive, we know our power triangle is pointing up. The real power, which is the base of the power triangle, is 40 kW. And we're told that this angle is related to power factor. In fact, the cosine of theta is equal to 0 0.8. Solving for theta, which we do using the arc cosine, so shift, cosine inverse, 0 0.8, close, equals. So that's 30. 6.9 degrees, 36.9 degrees. We also know that power factor is the ratio of real power to apparent power. 0 0.8 is equal to the real power, that's 40 kW, over the apparent power. Solving for that, by the way, that's not a vector. It's a scalar, so that's 40 divided by 0 0.8. So that gives us 50 kVA. So 50 kVA. And you may recognize this as a 3, 4, 5 triangle. You'll know that this here is 30 kVar. And if you wanted to verify that, you could use the Pythagorean theorem, 40 squared plus 30 squared equals, take the square root of the answer, equals, and there's our 50. Once we have the complete power triangle for each individual load, we can add them all together to find the total complex power. Again, total complex power is the summation of the individual loads. For us, that equals 5 plus 40 plus the imaginary pieces, so J30, that takes care of that, minus J5, and this whole thing is kVars, excuse me, kVA. From there, we add the pieces together, and we end up with 45 plus J25 kVA. 
So remember that complex power is additive, just like we said in this equation here. The total complex power is the summation of the loads. Also, as an intermediate step, I would encourage you to sketch the power triangle for each and every load. That way you can graphically see what's going on and how those loads interact. While we're on the topic, I'd like to show you how many different ways there are to express complex power. One way is to present the power triangle. And I would argue that's one of the more straightforward ways. For our purposes, we'll assume this is 10 kW, 5 k bars, and that works out to 11.2 kVA and an angle of 26.6 degrees. From there, you could say complex power is equal to 10 plus J5 kVA. Okay, that one's pretty straightforward. We've dealt with that before. You could also convert that into polar form. And you could say complex power is 11.2 kVA at a phase angle of 26.6 degrees. That one we've also dealt with. We could talk about a complex power in terms of real power, so 10 kW, at a certain power factor, power factor equal 89.4%, and we'd have to specify that it was inductive. And remember that the cosine of 26.6 is your power factor. Cosine 26.6 should give us 89.4%. We can express complex power in terms of voltage and current vectors. If we let voltage equal 480 volts at a phase angle of zero degrees, we would find the current is equal to 23.3 amps at a phase angle of negative 26.6 degrees. Using this formula here, we're going to multiply that voltage by that current, and we're going to verify the complex power. So that's 480 multiplied by 23.3 at a phase angle of negative, correction, not negative, because we need the complex conjugate. So that's an angle of 26.6 should give us, there it is, 10 plus J5 kVA. We know that complex power is equal to voltage by the complex conjugate of the current, but it's also equal to the magnitude of the current squared by an impedance, and it's also equal to the magnitude of the voltage squared divided by the complex conjugate of the impedance. Therefore, we could express complex power using impedance. Right? We could use this impedance and either the current or the voltage. That would be enough to calculate complex power. We could express complex power using an ideal motor. For example, if we let that motor be 13.4 horsepower, and then we converted horsepower to watts, 746 watts per horsepower, that would give us our 10 kW. So 13.4 times 746 is equal to, there it is. 10 kW. And then if we express the power factor, 89.4, and by virtue of being a motor, we would assume that it's inductive, we have enough information to calculate complex power. In the near future, we're going to talk about real world motors. When we get there, we'll talk about efficiency. For example, we could let the efficiency equal 85%. If the motor was 11.4 horsepower, 
and if the power factor was 89.4%, we have enough information to calculate complex power. Let's go back and count. How many different ways are there to express complex power? There's one, there's two, so that's rectangular form, three is polar form, four when you're given a power factor and a real power. In terms of voltage and current, that's five ways. In terms of impedance and a voltage or a current, you could talk about it as a motor, and you could talk about real-world motors. So that's at least eight different ways that you can ask that same question. Every single one of them brings you back to a power triangle. And once again, I would encourage you to sketch the power triangle for each and every problem that you're trying to solve. It will help you see those relationships and make sure you're on the right track. If nothing else, it gives me the greater and intermediate step where I can say, yes, you got that far on a quiz or an exam, and I can give you credit for at least that piece of it. Before we get to three phase, let's do a transformer example or two. For this problem, we want to find the primary current and the primary voltage. On your note card, you should have the formulas dealing with transformers. The turns ratio, which is defined as the number of turns on the primary divided by the number of turns on the secondary, is equal to the voltage ratio. The voltage on the primary divided by the voltage on the secondary is equal to the current ratio which is the current on the secondary over the current in the primary. And be careful, the primary is on this side for the turns and the voltage, but it's downstairs when you're dealing with the current. The other thing you should have on your note card is that the complex power in the primary is equal to the complex power in the secondary. In a few moments, we're going to take advantage of this fact, and you'll see that solving transformer problems can actually be quite simple. Moving back, let's solve this problem using two methods. In the first method, we will perform this operation right here. We'll calculate the current in the secondary and then we'll reflect it across the transformer into the primary. The complex conjugate of current is equal to the complex power of the load divided by our voltage vector. And we're going to assume that this voltage is 277 volts at a phase angle of zero degrees. When you do these calculations, something has to be at zero degrees. So we may as well let our load voltage be that. That gives us 30 plus J10 KVA over 277, phase angle zero degrees. The current is therefore 30 plus 10 J equals, we're going to multiply this by 1,000 now, and then we're going to divide it by 277. What you see displayed on the calculator is not the current. It's the complex conjugate of the current, which is 114 at a phase angle of 18.4 degrees. That's not what we wanted. We wanted the current. And the current is equal to 114 amps at a phase angle of negative 18.4 degrees. That current is right here. It's 114 amps at a phase angle of negative 18.4. We're looking for the current here, the current in the primary. 
we can set up a ratio. So 15, which is the turns ratio here. So 15 is to 1 as, now make sure you get this right, because right? here it's primary, and then the primary is downstairs here. So we would say that is 114 amps at a phase angle of negative 18.4 over the current in the primary. By the way, this is the current in the secondary. With a bit of cross multiplication, we go to the calculator and we say 114 at a phase angle of negative 18.4 divided by 15 yields 7.6 amps at a phase angle of negative 18.4. So our current in the primary is equal to 7.6 amps at a phase angle of negative 18.4. Four. And the voltage in the primary is simply this on the low voltage side multiplied by 15. So 277 times 15 gives us 4160. And that's at a phase angle of zero degrees. All right, so that was method number one, arguably the harder method. An easier method is to recognize that the complex power in the primary is equal to the complex power in the secondary. If that's true, we can redraw the circuit to look like this, where this voltage is 4160 at a phase angle of zero degrees. How's that for a nice trick? We got rid of the transformer. All we had to do was take our power and reflect it to the other side of the transformer. And recognize that it had a 15 to 1 voltage ratio to give us 4160 volts right there. Once that's done, we can calculate the current in the primary as the power divided by the voltage. So 30 plus J10. KVA over 4160. So 30 plus 10J times 1000 divided by 4160 should give us the same current as before. There it is. So our current is 7.6 amps at a phase angle of negative 18.4. You'll notice that the sign here is positive, but I wrote negative here. That's because I took the complex conjugate when I transferred from the calculator over to the screen here. Here's another transformer example. In this problem, we have two transformers. We have the low voltage side on T1, the high voltage side, the high voltage side of T2, and then the low voltage side. The reason for all of this extra circuitry is found right here. These two components represent the transmission line. One of the reasons we have transformers is so that we can step up voltage while lowering the current, which keeps our power loss, which is to say our I squared R losses in the power line low. If you didn't have high voltage, low current in that transmission line, you would have very high losses and you would have a system that's, well, it's so expensive that it wouldn't be able to operate. We'll start this problem the same way we did the previous one, which is to say, we're going to take this load and we're gonna push it to the other side of the transformer. We can do that because the complex power in the primary is equal to the complex power in the secondary. When that's done, we can redraw the circuit to look like this. With this voltmeter reading not 480, but 10 times that high. So 4,800 volts at a phase angle 
of zero degrees. To get started, let's calculate the power triangle. The base is 60 kW. Again, that's real power. The angle theta is determined by the power factor, where cosine of theta is equal to 0 0.8 gives us a theta of the arc cosine of 0 0.8. So that's 36.9 degrees. The hypotenuse is 60 kW divided by the power factor. Remember that the power factor is defined as the ratio of real power to apparent power. And that is 60 divided by 0.8 gives us 75 kVA. Which means S is 75 kVA at an angle of 36.9 degrees. Knowing that, we can calculate the current. That's this equation right here, where the complex power is equal to a voltage vector divided by the complex conjugate of the current. So current is equal to S, correction, complex conjugate of the current, is equal to S over the voltage, which is 75 kVA, angle 36.9 degrees, all over 4,800. So our current is 75,000 at a phase angle of 36.9. See, is that correct? Yep, a phase angle 36.9 divided by 4,800. So our current is 15.6 amps at a phase angle of negative 36.9 degrees. Notice what I did there. The calculator says it's a positive angle, but I want the complex conjugate of it, so I took the negative angle. So if we come back here, that's this current in that direction. Actually, it's the current going into the load. That is 15.6 amps at a phase angle of negative 36.9 degrees. The voltage at this point here, using KVL, we would say that the voltage on the secondary of T1 is equal to the voltage of the line, where we define the line as this piece here, plus the voltage on the load, which is 4,800. So the voltage on the secondary of T1 is equal to the voltage on the line. That voltage could be calculated as a current by an impedance. So the current is 15.6 amps, angle negative 36.9 degrees. Okay, so that, again, we're calculating a voltage. So we cover up the voltage, and we want a current by an impedance. So the impedance of the line is 2 plus J6, and then we add the 4,800. The voltage on the secondary of T1, using the calculator, that's 15.6 at a phase angle of negative 36.9, multiplied by 2 plus J6. I did tell you to use the parentheses, didn't I? I think I did. Use the parentheses, or this calculator will not perform the operation for you. For example, on that second piece, if I had not used the parentheses, it would have multiplied this number by 2 and then added J6, which is not what you want. So just, just be careful. Use the parentheses, okay? All right, let's see what happens. So that gives us a voltage of 98.7 volts. 
So 98.7 at a phase angle of 34.7 plus our original 4,800 volts. We put that all together, the voltage on the secondary of T1, again, adding 4,800, is... 4880 volts at a phase angle of 0 0.659 degrees. And finally, we can get to this point here where we say the voltage on the primary of T1 is equal to this divided by 10. So that's 488 volts at that phase angle of 0 0.65. Nine, and the current on the primary of T1 is, let's see, where did it go? Where is our current? Right there. So it's that 15.6 multiplied by 10. So 156 amps at a phase angle of negative 36.9 degrees. While we're here, let's put them back together again just to see if we have some level of sanity in our answer. So complex power is equal to a voltage by the complex conjugate of the current. So 488 volts at a phase angle of 0 0.659 by 156 amps at a phase angle of negative 30 correction. It's complex conjugate, so it's a phase angle of 36.9 degrees. That works out to Pren 488 at a phase angle of 0 0.659 multiplied by 156 at a phase angle of 36.9. Now, before I hit equals, what do you expect the answer to be? Now, originally, we had this as our power triangle. We said 60 kW. Yeah, fair enough. However, there's some loss in the line. It's not a lot, but there is some loss in the line. So when I hit equals, this better be more than 60 kW or something was wrong. And the answer is there is 349 watts lost in our line. We'll call that, let's see, divide by 1,000 for kilowatts. There we go, that's better. So we'll call that 60.3 plus J46.4 kVA. If we were to sketch a power flow diagram, it would look something like this we would say that 60.3 kW went in, 300 was lost to the line, and the load received 60 kW. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's get on to three phase. To get us started, let's compare motors. Let's take a single phase motor and compare it to a three phase motor. For each column, we have a comparable 5 horsepower motor. The single phase motor will set you back about $1,360. On the three phase side of the house, it'll set you back about $870. Same horsepower output. The single phase motor weighs 80 pounds. The three-phase motor weighs 64 pounds. This is starting to look like most of the advantages go to three-phase motors. Had we used a larger motor, maybe a 50 horsepower or 100 horsepower or maybe a thousand horsepower, well good luck. The single-phase motor is not an option. The economics just don't make any sense. So it turns out that not only are the three-phase motors a little less expensive on the low side at five horsepower, but they're the only 
motor available to do the job when you get up to the higher horsepowers. So what is three phase? Well, let's start by constructing a three phase generator. We're going to take an AC source. We're going to take another AC source. We'll connect them up like that. And then we'll take one more. Together, these will provide you with three phases. We would call this phase A. This is the neutral, phase B, and phase C. Let this one be 120 volts at a phase angle of zero degrees. We'll let B be 120 volts at a phase angle of negative 120. And we'll let C be 120 volts at a phase angle of negative 240. Or if you prefer, you could simply say that's 120 degrees. Again, just go around the circle the other way. So that's one way that you could connect up generators. We call this a Y. Or a star is another name. The symbol for this type of connection is a Y. Because if you flipped it upside down, that is how the connections look. You could also consider it a star because all of the points are radiating out from the center. Right, this point right here, this neutral is common to all elements. We could have connected the generators in what's called a delta configuration. Let that be positive, a negative, to a positive, to a negative, to a positive, to a negative. We'll let this be 208 at a phase angle of zero degrees. 208 volts at a phase angle of negative 120 and 208 volts at a phase angle of 120. A phase, B phase, C phase. Again, this one here is called a delta, abbreviated like so. You'll notice in this one, there is no neutral. You could say that is the defining piece for a delta, in the same way that the defining piece for a star was the fact that there was a neutral with this common connection between all elements. Since we're back on our Y connection, there's something I want to show you. If we put a voltmeter here, you would agree that that reads 120 volts. The question I have for you is, what if you put a voltmeter across both lines? What is the voltage A with respect to B? It looks like a challenge. It's not. You have done this hundreds of times at this point. You start in the lower left-hand corner and you walk the loop. You use KVL. We are here. We walk into a positive terminal. That yields 120 volts at a phase angle of negative 120. We continue our loop. We walk into this power supply. We walk in on a negative terminal, which means we record that as negative. So negative 120 volts, phase angle of zero degrees. We continue on, and we say, well, there's the voltage A to B, which brings us back to the starting point. So KVL will tell us that the summation of these voltages is equal to zero. Solving for volts A to B, that becomes 120 minus 120 angle negative 120. Using the calculator, one, whoops, got to turn it on first. 120 minus paren 120 phase angle of negative 120 is, in polar form, 
208 at a phase shift of 30 degrees. So a phase to neutral would read 120 volts, but a phase to a phase would read 208 volts. And this is something you want to put down on your note card. Voltage phase to phase is equal to the root 3 of a voltage phase to neutral. And you might also see that as a voltage line to line is equal to a voltage line to neutral. In our case, it was root 3 by 120. So 120 times the square root of 3 should give us that 208. Just a reminder, these are scalars as if you had actually put a voltmeter in that position. Here it would read 120, here it would read 208. So again, get that one on your note card. And now we are going to introduce what is arguably the most important thing you're going to learn about three phase today. It's the one thing that's going to save you a tremendous amount of work. It's the thing that allows you to take what looks like a complex system and convert it back into a single phase representation. Once you've done that, all the tools you learned before are applicable. So give me a moment to set it up, please. This is a balanced system. We have equal voltages on our generator phases. So that's phase A, phase B, phase C. And we have equal loads. We'll let each of these be 10 ohms. If you're looking at this, we would call this a Y connection. So a Y connected generator to a Y connected load. We have three amp meters and each amp meter is going to measure the current flowing into this system. You'll likely guess this already, but because we have those three current flowing in, we're going to make some kind of statement about Kirchhoff's current law. So hold that thought in your mind. Let's do the phase A loop first. So there's a current that should be flowing this way. And I think you'll agree that's 120 volts divided by 10 ohms. In fact, we could just call that, we could call that 12 amps at a phase angle of zero degrees. Again, that's this current here. So we're gonna say the summation of the current at this node here is equal to 12 amps at a phase angle of zero degrees. That takes care of our first loop. Let's look at the B phase loop. The current would go like this. Once again, I think you'll agree that it is 12 amps, but this time at a phase angle of negative 120. So plus 12 amps at a phase angle of negative 120. And finally, we have the C loop, which is, whoops, excuse me. Finally, we have the C loop, which is going through the neutral. And it comes through here, goes through the central node that we keep focused on, and then goes back on the neutral. And we would record that as 12 amps at a phase angle of 120 degrees. So what do you get if you add all those up? The summation of the currents. So that's 12 plus 12 at a phase angle of 120, correction, negative 120, plus 12 at a phase angle of 120. And the answer is zero. Zero amps. That's a rather interesting result, isn't it? 
makes you wonder if maybe something was done wrong with the problem. And as, well, Dolan made a mistake, it's right here. You'll notice that node. How many wires enter? You have the A phase, you have the B phase, you have the C phase, but you also have the neutral. The neutral also enters that. If we wanted to be complete, we would have said plus the current in the neutral wire. Right? The summation of all of those would equal something. What this implies is that the neutral didn't matter. The current in the neutral wire is equal to zero. Current A goes in, current B goes in, current C goes in, and together they all take care of each other. And there is no current in a balanced system. And we have to be very careful. We're talking about a balanced system where the generator voltages are equal and the loads are all equal. In that balanced system, there is no current in the neutral. There is no current in the neutral of a balanced system. That allows us to do something that is almost magical. Since there is no current flowing here, we can say that this point here, that the center of this star is equal to the center of that star. We can take those two points and we can move them together conceptually, which means as far as a three-phase problem is concerned, this stuff here just evaporated. We can do all of our calculations with a single phase representation. So if we were to redraw this on what's called a per phase solution, it looks like this. We have 120 volts at a phase angle of zero degrees, a current meter, and that resistor, and a neutral, which carries no current, but yet connects the two together, which seems odd, but it's still just a wire. So if this is 10 ohms, that means this is 12 amps at a phase angle of zero degrees. We can take this concept and carry it on to more complicated things. For example, we have a system with phase A, phase B, phase C, and a neutral. We have a load connected like so where each load is 2 ohms per phase. And we'll connect them up to phase A, phase B, phase C. And it's not necessary, but we'll add the neutral wire anyway. And then we'll delta connect a more complicated load. We'll let this be 9 plus J6 ohms per phase. We'll connect it up to phase A, phase B, and phase C. From our previous discussion, we said that we wanted to take a three phase system and somehow convert it into a single phase representation. Well, part of this is pretty straightforward. For example, this Y connection can be done quite easily. We say, well, look, if we go from line to neutral, it's just 2 ohms. Let me give myself a little more room here. Right? Line to neutral is 2 ohms. So we say that's line A and neutral. This one's not quite so simple, but that's not such a big problem as you might think because it can be shown that the impedance of a Y is the impedance of a delta divided by three. So you noticed we had nine plus J six per phase, right? So this was a nine ohm resistor and this was a J six inductor. Well, if we took each of those and we divided it by three, right? So the impedance of the Y 
is the impedance of the delta, which in this case is 9 plus J6 divided by 3. So the impedance of our equivalent Y circuit is equal to 3 plus J2. So we take this piece and we redraw it like this, where the resistor is 3 and the inductor is J2. Here's another inductor, J2, resistance of 3, J2, a resistance of 3. Now that we've transformed our delta load into a Y equivalent, we can come back and add that on our single phase circuit that models the three phase system. So that's 3, J2. And from there, you guys know how to deal with that. So the impedance of a phase is equal to 2 in parallel with 3 plus J2. So Z phase is equal to 2 inverse plus pren 3 plus 2J invert equals invert equals. So that's 1.31 plus J 0 0.28 ohms, which means that that original system we drew up above could be represented like so. Well, that's connected to A phase. This one's connected to B phase. That one's connected to C phase. The resistors are 1.31, and the inductor is J0.28. So this piece, poorly as it is drawn, is equivalent to these two put together. Again, our process for doing that was to say our goal is a per-phase solution. We took the Y piece and we brought it here. We did a delta to Y conversion. And then we took the per-phase Y and brought it here. We put them together the same way that we have all of our single phase circuits up to this point. And then we sketched it here as the equivalent load. Just to be complete, we could have gone one step further. We could have taken this Y and put it back to delta. And to do that, we would have said the impedance of the delta is three times the impedance of the Y. So the impedance of each delta phase is, well, it's already in our calculator, so just multiply that by 3. That's 3.9 plus J0.83 ohms per phase. Don't forget these. These are very useful equations. The impedance of a delta is 3 times the impedance of a Y or this one up here, the impedance of a Y is the impedance of a delta divided by 3. And this entire thought that you can do three-phase calculations on a per-phase basis is very useful to us, as we saw right here. I think I mentioned this, but just in case I didn't, to use this technique, you had to take all of your loads and put them in terms of a Y. Right, you needed the Y connected per phase impedance. We've covered a lot of material so far. I want to leave you with just a few additional thoughts, concepts, not math this time. We identify a three phase system as three phase vectors. Our A phase vector is here. Our B phase vector is delayed by 120 degrees. It's located here. And our C phase vector has the same magnitude, but is delayed by yet again another 120 degrees. 
We've said this many times that our vectors rotate in this direction. So from a stationary observer's standpoint, you see phase A followed by phase B followed by phase C. If you wanted to make that a wheel, it would look like this. And the wheel is turning that way. You always see them in that order, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. We call this a positive sequence. There's nothing that says we can't have a negative sequence. On the complex plane, this looks very similar. Real, imaginary. Once again, we'll put our A vector here. This time, we'll swap positions, though, and we're going to let this be the C vector, and we'll let this one be the B vector. As the vectors rotate in this direction, you will see A, C, B, A, C, B. If this was a wheel, we would say that it is A, B, C. We call this the A, B, C sequence. We call this the A, C, B sequence. Positive sequence, negative sequence. Why do you care? What's in it for you and how do you remember this? Consider this. If this is the three-phase system, A, B, C, and if this is a motor, with this sequence, the motor would turn in a clockwise direction. However, if you reversed any two wires, you just change the direction of rotation on a motor. Swap any two wires and it will change again. So now we're going this direction. So that's one way to look at it. The sequence, the order of the phases, will change the direction of rotation of a motor. Here's another way to look at this. Suppose you had a generator that had a positive sequence on it. Maybe this is the national power grid and all the generators that make up that system. Now suppose you had your own generator. And for whatever reason, that generator was connected up incorrectly. So that when you got to this point here, it presented as a negative sequence. Which means two of the wires have been flipped. Well, there's a circuit breaker here. If you do not check the rotational sequence of your generators before you connect them together. And if you are unfortunate enough to close that circuit breaker on a positive and a negative sequence, you've just created a massive short circuit. If you're lucky, the circuit breaker will just open up again. If you're very unlucky, this generator will be laying sideways and you'll be given a pink slip. You should know that it is standard practice to check and recheck that you have the proper phase sequence between generators before you close the breaker. In fact, you can even buy relays, relays to put into your control panels that will tell you if you have the proper sequence. Before the class is over, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about this paralleling generators procedure. And you'll see that this phase sequence detection isn't that terribly complicated. In fact, you could do it with three light bulbs. I have a few parting thoughts for you, and then we'll call it a day. We mentioned three phase systems. At this point, you should recognize this as a Y connection. Phases A, B, C, and neutral. We call this voltage a voltage A neutral and we talked about this voltage being excuse me voltage a to b and if you wanted to put a voltmeter here we could call this b to c this is what's known as a line to neutral and i believe somewhere on your note card you have this equation 
It talks about a voltage line to neutral is a voltage line to line divided by the root three. So if this is 120, we would find out that an A to B would be 208. Or if this was 277, you would find that the voltage A to B is 480. And the last thing I want to share with you is if you see a number all by itself, if you see a number by itself, for example, if you saw a sign that said danger, 4160, you should know first that's very likely to be a three phase system. Second, it's an RMS voltage. Third, it's likely a line to line voltage. Some of the common voltages you'll see are 208, 480, 4160. That's 208 volts RMS, line to line. 480 volts, line to line. Or you might see that as phase to phase. 4160, phase to phase. If we were to convert that to a phase to neutral, this becomes 120 volts line to neutral, 277 line to neutral, and 4160 divided by the square root of 3 is 2400 line to neutral. Here's a parting thought for you. If you are in a commercial building, chances are very high that you are fed with a 208 line-to-line -line system. The outlet that's powering your computer is probably provided one phase from that 208 going to neutral. These voltages are probably close by as well, and that would be running the pumps and blowers that support the building. 